So, uh, who wants to talk about student credit? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't. <laughs> and the uh, script for a, a goat roping like this one uh, requires that I tell you how honored I am to be speaking here today. Uh, and for once, that's actually truer than you can possibly know. Uh, this really is a privilege. I intend to abuse it. <laughs> a long time ago, uh, 20 years, 6 months, and 20 days, uh, I stood in front of an ALS meeting room in San Francisco and made the case, unsuccessfully, uh, for a gathering of technologists working in law schools. ALS uh, proved not to be the vehicle uh, for that gathering of technologists, just as it is not the vehicle for so many other things. <laughs> but a few months later, Kelly, in the person of Ron Stout, stepped forward and offered to host the first of these. Uh, John has been the impresario and guiding light and chief comedian of this conference from the beginning, and later became the executive director of Cali, as you know. For those of you who are wondering, uh, although he did work at the Chicago Kent Law School, he is not the Earl of Kent that I'm talking about today, uh, nor did he actually spend time in a Turkish prison. Uh, first, some disclaimers. I, I have no law degree. I'm, I'm no kind of librarian. I have no formal education in computer science. Uh, and more to the point, I haven't actually done what you do. I have not run a law school technology operation for nearly 18 years, and I no longer have the slightest idea how that gets done. Um, nevertheless, I expect that this will not be a comfy chat, either for me or for some of you, uh, because law schools are often very, very uncomfortable places for many who work to make them better. This is a talk for people who want to use technology in innovative, focused ways, but who instead operate under vague mandates to keep everybody happy. This is a talk for anyone who has ever sat in a meeting, wondering at what precise moment Rod Serling is going to step out and confirm that you have entered some academic bureaucratic twilight zone. Uh, it's a talk for people who are not allowed to do what they're asked to do, uh, who have been tied to a chair and commanded to dance. And above all, uh, it's for all of you who are sitting somewhere in the auditorium fiddling with a Linux laptop, uh, vaguely aware that some pompous old fart is droning away at the lighted end of the room and hoping that the whole thing will be over soon so that you can go talk to somebody about some fucked up thing that PHP is doing. <laughs> something like a three-year series of sexual adventures with actresses, uh, or actors, uh, punctuated by the occasional class where people paint their faces white and practice pulling on imaginary ropes. Uh, but they don't really have the nerve to ask you about that. Uh, so instead, they ask you who your favorite Shakespeare character is. Sort of like asked, being asked what your favorite Supreme Court case is. You need to be careful about how you answer this if you want to look like you know what you're talking about. Hamlet, Nat, too easy. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, satisfyingly obscure, but a little cute, what with Stoppard and all. Coriolanus, great for riotous gags based on the name, uh, but on the whole, nah. Uh, which is how I always end up with the Earl of Kent. He's in a well-known play, he's in King Lear, he's visible enough that people tend to remember him, even though they usually confuse him with Gloucester, who gets his eyes put out in a much juicier scene that was sort of an Elizabethan version of 24. <laughs> uh, but he's also obscure enough to make me look like I know what I'm talking about, and as it happens, he really is my favorite character in Shakespeare. Uh, we're going to see him in action in a minute. Uh, but first, how many of you actually don't know the plot of King Lear? Uh, be brave. Come on, come on. I know you're not all lit majors. All right. So Lear, here's what Sparkman says. I pulled this off off my... Uh, Lear, the, the ruler of Britain, enters his throne room and he announces his plan to divide the kingdom among his three daughters. He intends to give up the responsibilities of government and spend his old age visiting his children. He commands his daughters to say which of them loves him the most, promising to give the greatest share to that daughter. Lear's scheming older daughters, Goneril and Regan, respond to his test with overblown flattery. But Cordelia, Lear's youngest and favorite daughter, refuses to speak. 
In response, Deer flies into a rage, disowns Cordelia, and divides her share of the kingdom between her two sisters. And it's at that point that we pick up the action. Let's, uh, let, let's watch a clip here. I apologize for the bad subtitles, but I pulled all this stuff from YouTube. Hold <laughs> oh, oh, <coughs> With my two daughters' powers digest this herd. Let pride, which she calls plainness, marry her. I do invest you jointly with my power, preeminence, and all the large effects of a troop with majesty. Ourself, by monthly course, with reservation of a hundred nights by you to be sustained, shall our abode make with you by due terms. And we will retain the name and all the addition of a king, the sway of the new execution of the rest, beloved sons, be yours, which to confirm this coronet part between you. Royal Lear, whom I have ever honored as my king, loved as my father, as my master followed, as my great patron thought on in my prayers. The bow is bent and drawn, make from the shaft. Let it fall, rather, though the fork invade the region of my heart. If it can't unmannerly when Lear is mad, what would start to, old man? Hmm? Think so that duty shall have bread to speak and power to flattery vows? To plainness on us bound, and majesty falls to folly. Reserve thy state, and in my best consideration, check this hideous rashness. Answer my life, my judgment. Thy youngest daughter does not love thee least. Nor are those empty hearted whose low sounds reverb no hollowness. Kept on thy life, no more. Life I never held but as a pawn to wait against thy enemies, nor fear to lose it by safety being motive. How could my sight see better, Leah, than that they still remain the true black of thine eyes? Oh, now my Apollo King must waste thy gods in vain. Those papers, uh, how many of you have actually read them, by the way? 
know this was sort of a hot controversy in the law, I guess, so somehow. Uh, papers have a lot to say, and it, it's hard to summarize them in a way that's not too obviously self-serving, and, and although they really are about librarians and libraries, I, I would ask you to filter what I say a little bit and imagine that I'm talking about technologists and technology. The two are very different in some ways, but in some important ways they are not. Donovan had the choice of weapons at the start of this duel, and he chose loaded language to describe the respective positions, the so-called weak model of librarianship, which holds service to the patron as its goal, and a so-called strong model that honors a lofty professional ideal and assumes a higher calling in the construction of libraries as a kind of cultural museum. Uh, the fight is about which of those models is a better response to the technologies that threaten to make librarians irrelevant. Search engines in general, and Google in particular, are sort of held up as satanic poster children by all parties. The uh, essence of Donovan's argument is in this quote. The future of libraries, therefore, depends upon which of two responses are taken to patrons' demands for Google-like experiences. The weak model will capitulate in the belief that the librarian's highest obligation is to satisfy the patron on his own terms. The strong model will not allow these pressures to detract from the other obligations of the profession, which looks to the construction of socially useful institutions of cultural knowledge. Uh, Danner, unfortunately, I have no pithy quote for it. Uh, he's harder to summarize, mostly because his arguments are more nuanced, even as they go over much more territory. In general, Dick's a realist. Uh, he knows that technology is here and that it can't be fended off by building monuments. He's seeking other ways for librarians to respond to the changes that it brings in the particular tasks that librarians perform. The claim, and I think he's right, is that although the objects librarians treat and the techniques they use to treat them will inevitably change, there are fundamental activities that won't. Those activities are less fundamental just because they seem slightly vague and slightly abstract when we try to describe them in ways that will survive beyond the technology of the moment. And while Donovan starts this fight by pushing Danner into a corner labeled service, I don't think that the service Dick wants to offer is unquestioning fulfillment of every user whim. Sometimes it's hard to tell. There are three points worth noting here. First, this is a long-standing argument in sociology and organizational behavior as it applies to the professions. And it sets up a sort of contrast between servant and priest that can be applied to practically any workplace group. Arguments about what professions are and how they come and go and who gets to be one and who doesn't are never really permanently resolved. Second, uh, neither Donovan nor Danner seem to take much notice of the context in which libraries exist. They seem to be talking about a dysfunctional love triangle whose members are individual librarians, patrons, and librarian aspirations. That discussion takes place in and around something called a library, which appears to be floating in space. Uh, one would have us see the library as a monument to culture, the other one as a service center, but neither one puts the library into a law school, a law firm, or any other context. The facts of modern institutional life are otherwise. Librarians and technologists are institutional employees, they are stewards of institutional resources. It would be very, very hard for them to pursue their activities without law schools to buy the books and computers and assemble an audience for them. There are exceptions, of course. Uh, the Jenkins Law Library, which stands not too far from where we are now, is a, a notable exception. Uh, but for the most part, libraries and technology departments are parts of larger enterprises, and the people who steer them spend much of their time as managers of and competitors for budgets, space, and personnel. Finally, both these positions are really easily distorted. Donovan kicks it off by referring to the models as strong and weak, but it just won't stop there. A service model can be easily caricatured as creating a class of codependent, passive-aggressive servants and is often corrupted by the status structure of law schools toward exactly that result. Donovan's strong value-centered model can be seen as the establishment of a self-serving priesthood whose devotions take no notice of larger institutional priorities or the needs of those it imagines to be among the faithful and is often corrupted by people with a poor grasp of user needs to do exactly that. There are some examples. Very long ago, one Ivy League law school had a network administrator who made the faculty take exams before he would let them on his network. 
<laughs> and most people find that a Latin high mass is easier to understand than a geek's explanation of what has gone wrong with something on that network. <laughs> Uh, on the other side of the fence, I actually once heard somebody tell a room full of people at this very conference that she had to create document folders and subfolders herself on the hard drives of her faculty members because they could not be expected to do it themselves. And the stunning thing was that no one present at that session jumped up on a chair and started yelling, my God, woman, don't you have anything better to do? <laughs> Law schools don't need priests and they don't need lackeys. Law school reality is both more complex and much simpler than that. Real activities in real workplaces, in real law schools, involve competition for resources, the abilities of individuals, and continual bargaining between service providers and service consumers about what consumers can reasonably be expected to do for themselves. Those bargains get made differently in different places at different times, and they're constantly renegotiated in the face of change. We usually point to technology as the disruptor, but in fact, the shop floor realities are conditioned by personalities, by organizational structure, by the availability of services from third parties in the larger university, on the internet, or in the private sector, and by a rising level of user comfort with technology, among many other things. Those are the complexities. There's a simpler, far more important part of this that we can only get at by asking just why the hell anybody cares about any of this. In my experience, most of us don't think about professions most of the time. We get up and drag ass to work, uh, whether we're law teachers or opera singers or technologists or librarians or plumbers. We like to go to work if that's a place where our expertise is respected. And if we're not respected, and we see ourselves as having little control over the very things for which we're held responsible, all of us get very, very unhappy. At the simplest level, talk about professional models is nothing more and nothing less the displaced anxiety about where we stand in the workplace. Librarians have, for a long time, been able to draw some comfort and some stability from trappings built up around the technology of print. That is going away. Technologists never had such a stable place to stand, and universities and law schools are particularly anxious workplaces now. So maybe we should spend less time debating professional models and concentrate on why it is that we need to talk about them so badly. One way to investigate that is to concentrate on the question of independent judgment and on when, why, and how it is exercised. I was very surprised that neither Donovan nor Danner explored this question in any detail. And I brought along the Earl of Kent this morning because he is such a dramatic example of what I'm talking about. No dean, uh, at least not to my knowledge, has ever skewered an IT director with a dagger, <laughs> even in the wake of an email system collapse. Uh, but the exercise of independent judgment uh, particularly by technologists, remains problematic. It, it's the kernel in the middle of a complex set of institutional and cultural problems that prevent effective communication and interaction between the different groups that every law school must house. Simply put, independent professional judgment is the ability to recommend or to do what the client needs rather than what the client says they want. On the surface, it's simple. But in modern society, even in uncontestably professional fields like law and medicine, that is almost always a matter of negotiation rather than something that arises a priori from roles. These days, patients shop for doctors, clients shop for lawyers, and they do so from a position of strength. The more so as the, inter the internet and services like WebMD reduce information asymmetries. Indeed, law school classrooms may be one of the last places on the planet where all of the expertise is presumed to be at one end of the room. Even there, it seems fragile, as fears about Wi-Fi and students with laptops reveal. So why should anybody care about this? Well, first of all, without mutual respect, it's impossible to have any kind of effective collaboration. That's especially true when <coughs> collaboration has to occur across status boundaries. Second, any effective attempt at stewardship of school resources demands similar respect. Where there's competition for something finite, someone is going to have to be told no. That no needs to be given for good reason and it needs to be respected. The alternative is best, a kind of tragedy of the commons where attempts to satisfy everyone end up satisfying no one. Finally, dismissing the expertise of other people can be really, really expensive. Here's an example that cost about $50 billion. 
The man testifying to Congress is Harry Markopoulos. He tried unsuccessfully for nine years to get the SEC to take action against Bernie Madoff. And I uh, actually apologize for the bad sound on this clip, which was actually the best version I, I could find sitting on the web. I'd also like to recognize Ed Mannion of the Boston Regional Office of the SEC. He was my constant confidant throughout the past nine years. If not for his encouragement and bravery, I would have quit the investigation after my second submission, which was October 2001. Mr. Mannion told me that his agency had dropped the ball, but that I had a public duty to keep investigating because the Madoff Ponzi scheme was such a clear and present danger to the nation's capital market that if the SEC wasn't going to investigate, well, someone had to, and he didn't think there was anybody better qualified than me to lead the investigation. Mr. Madoff kept taking the case to his superiors at the SEC, and he kept getting ignored because he was not a securities lawyer, only a chartered financial analyst with 25 years of trading and portfolio management experience in the industry. Sadly, the SEC does trust anyone with industry experience. I am very surprised that the SEC did not fire Mr. Mannion for his constant pestering about Mr. Madoff. The SEC to this day holds against him the fact that he kept bringing this case to his, their attention, and I believe he would be fired if he ever went public and told investors how strong an advocate he was on their behalf. I uh, chose this highly loaded, extremely unfair example because it is so very dramatic. Uh, and because Harry Markopoulos is so thoroughly convinced that his problem was lawyer arrogance at the SEC. A more detached observer might see less arrogance and instead look at the corrosive effects of bureaucracy on people who are strongly process-oriented by virtue of their professional training. Another might talk about the difficulty of communication between two professional cultures. One of those cultures is called to action by the kind by the funny things and the kinds of numbers that pile up around any kind of engineering, uh, financial or otherwise. The other culture is most persuaded by how well or poorly the problem fits with process and precedent. Just to be clear, I do realize that I'm talking about three things at once. The exercise of independent judgment, a more general problem of communication across workplace cultures, and the idea that collaboration is somehow essential to the law school enterprise. These things are tightly bound together. The honest exchange that forms the basis of collaboration is impossible without mutual respect, and I am no different from most people in that I see that those things that have been essential to my own success as equally important to everyone else. Uh, much of what I've been able to do in the last 18 years has been the product of a remarkably comfortable collaboration with a law teacher and former dean. And one of the things that has struck Peter Martin and I most forcibly over the years is just how reluctant everyone else was to see our work as a collaboration. <coughs> To many law faculty, the LII was always something Peter Martin did with the help of a capable, if slightly wild-eyed, servant. Uh, and at geek gatherings, the LII was always the technical project that Tom Bruce did, despite having to carry a law professor on his back. <laughs> Whatever the perception, the LII was, is, and always will be a product of strong collaborations among many people. And those collaborations have become the lens through which I see professional work in law schools. Sadly, collaborations are not easy to pull off. The reasons are built into the institutional terrain, into microtransactions between individuals and everything in between. Let me catalog a few. <coughs> Let's see if I can get the slide to change. For all that academic institutions value freedom of speech, plain speaking is not really part of the culture. Recently, I heard a Cornell administrator describe a particular committee structure as a triumph of consensus over accountability. <laughs> that is as true of the ways that we talk to each other as it is of the larger processes in which that talk takes place. Plain speaking that is seen as confrontational in law schools simply would not be seen that way in other workplaces. There is no doubt that tact is a necessary form of social lubrication, but there is also such a thing as an excessive emphasis on the possibility that someone somewhere might find the bald statement of a fact unwelcome. It's hard to be the bearer of any urgent information in that setting, let alone bad news. Up until a few years ago, law schools had very limited experience with other professional cultures. Multidisciplinary collaborations are now beginning to change that among faculty. But when technologists first came on the scene in the mid to late 1980s, there had been no experience with a new professional group inside law schools since the advent of law librarians at the beginning of the previous century. The ground rules in place at that time were not particularly helpful, partly 
That was because all prior experience with, had been with groups whose flagship technology was well understood. Familiar technologies like print are largely invisible, and unfamiliar, unstable technologies are highly visible even as they're hard to predict and manage. Technology and technologists have stuck out at least in part because what they do is unfamiliar, there's no settled method by which they do it, and there's a great need for experimentation. That's because the technology itself moves at a dizzying pace, and because the expectations of technology users are not only constantly rising, but are strongly conditioned by what they see in a marketplace that extends well beyond the law school. Students arrive each year, as all of you know, with a bewildering array of devices that they expect to be able to use as part of their legal education. And if the technologies are strange, the technologists are even stranger. There are ways in which they don't fit the prevailing patterns. Peter Martin once pointed out to me uh, that a long-standing and important belief that membership in the club called faculty brings with it, or that the benefits that that membership brings with it are equally shared among the members. There's equal access to library books, to research assistants, to travel money, and so on. Now we all know that that's a rule that is somewhat honored in the breach, uh, but there is a basic notion of equity in at least some things. Technologists, unfortunately, are not so easily shared. That plays out in an interesting way when we look at frontline support. I, I shudder, actually, to think how much time the people in this room have spent collectively trying to create both real and imagined equity in the way that help desk requests get serviced. The fact is that user support is an inherently unequitable process <coughs> and a very politically dangerous. It's inequitable because the least capable users are the most demanding and the most capable users are the most fun to play with. <laughs> that risks excluding the middle, and in this political environment, as in so many others, that's very unwise. The uproar that greets the failure of an email system is testimony to this. Of course an email failure is a disaster, but the response to it becomes all the more vehement because most users, the ones in the middle, the ones you never see, are thinking, you know, I don't ask for much from these guys, but at least they could keep the damn email system running. <laughs> The fact is that we expect technologists to exercise independent judgment in determining what gets serviced and how and when, and we almost never like the way they do that if we're the ones having a problem. And sometimes we don't know or just don't stop to think about how thinly spread the shared technologist resource actually is. A corollary to the idea that technologists are shareable is the idea that technologists are interchangeable, or at least should be. Mostly that's an impatient reaction to having problems referred from one technician to another. There's the idea that anybody I grab should be willing and able to solve any problem I might pose. Uh, that's unlikely to happen at any price point that law schools can afford, and so compromise is necessary. And like all compromises, the result in a less than perfectly responsive system, this one needs to be thoroughly understood by all those who are affected by it. Often it's not. While well, we're on the subject of resources, it's worth keeping in mind that a lot of management is simply good playground behavior. Most technology managers learn pretty quickly that you shouldn't bring gum to school unless you bring enough for everybody. Uh, but that isn't always possible. And that leads to resource competition among faculty members who are in any event highly competitive and who in many institutions see themselves increasingly as independent contractors. Over time, that competition hardens into the belief that the law school is a zero-sum status game in which anyone's gain in status is made at the expense of someone else. On that view, command over resources becomes important less because the resources themselves are needed uh, than because possession of them is a clear indicator of enhanced status. This is a particularly pernicious belief, and technologists are not the only ones who have to deal with it. Most deans and deanlets uh, know that on the morning after everyone finally has one of something, there will be some son of a bitch who shows up in his office wanting to. <laughs> Law schools have a hard time evaluating the work of technologists, and so they have a hard time managing them in the programs they supervise. Senior administrators often don't know a lot about what IT people do, how to figure out whether they're doing it well or not, or how to make IT work in the interest of the institution. But they have to have something to steer by, and that can lead to problems. Many institutions evaluate their IT departments exclusively by random sampling of the happiness factor among users, uh, particularly faculty users. 
End user satisfaction is important, to be sure, uh, but so is avoiding overreaction to particular end users who can never be satisfied, and to those who use strategic behavior around the presumed sins of the IT department to advance private political agendas. When it comes to institutional strategy, far too much reliance is placed on what other law schools are doing, and far too little on the particular needs and opportunities of particular schools. I'm a great believer in information sharing, that's why conferences like this are worth doing. But when things reach the point where the only acceptable evidence of merit is the fact that some other law school is doing it, well at that point our view of technology is a widescreen view of the butt of the lemming in front of us. <laughs> By the way, uh, never ever search Google Images for the phrase lemming butt. <laughs> Curious keyboarding out there. <laughs> I, I expect you'll find the Kim Kardashian picture soon. <laughs> okay, enough of that. As to the technologists themselves, how do you know a good one from a bad one? What would a good one look like anyway? Well, senior administrators are kind of hard put to answer those questions, so they get very, very nervous, and they get inclined to look around for some credentialing method that seems familiar. <coughs> it's easier to think that you can manage technologists just like a group you already understand, and that the good ones should look a lot like you. Uh, but loading up the job description with prerequisites drawn from everyone's list of comfy credentials has never been an especially good way to find the talent that you really need. And if you can't be sure that you're hiring the right people, I suppose you can at least put the entire department under the supervision of someone or something that is familiar. So technology gets supervised by someone who kind of knows about all that stuff, or gets put under committee review, or given to someone with some kind of acceptable credential. Uh, that creates apparatus that's often more familiar than it is functional. Like anybody else, technologists find it difficult to be supervised by people who don't understand what they do. Uh, that can lead to an uneasy sense that the school thinks that technology is just far too important to be run by anyone who knows anything about it. Uh, there's probably not much that can or should be done about that, and I'll have more to say about that later. Again, in many cases, the net result is simply that the entire deep strategy becomes just keep everybody happy, uh, and that is never realistic. That also makes it alarmingly easy for administrators to make decisions for which others are ultimately held accountable and to offer little protection to subordinates when clients and customers act out. Every organization needs to ensure that its people can exercise some control over the things for which they're responsible. And frankly, law schools are not especially good at that. The management of technology is vulnerable to externally created expectations that don't play well against institutional realities. H.L. Mencken once remarked that a wealthy man is somebody who earns more than his brother in law. <laughs> Most technologists have long since concluded that, so far as end users are concerned, anyone's brother-in-law knows more about computers than they do. <laughs> Similarly, any institution where a troublesome faculty member has just been on a one-semester visit becomes enshrined as a place whose technology rivals that of the Battlestar Galactic. <laughs> now, I've been throwing a lot of stones here, and it's, it's worth pointing out that neither I nor any other technologist is without sin. Uh, most of those sins are centered either in the belief in technology for its own sake or in poor consulting skills. I, I say consulting skills because people talk all the time about communication skills, and that's only part of the problem. Awareness of what a law school does and how it does it are crucial. Uh, I asked this question on TechNerds a couple of days ago. I'll ask it again now. How, how many people here are involved in projects uh, let's say fairly deep projects, not just extending the social media reach of the law school, but, but fairly deep projects that involve your alumni and placement offices that you've started in the last 18 months. Show of hands. Okay, so we've got like a scattering of people, five, six maybe. Uh, no, nothing on the program at the conference to do with that. And yet you would think that everyone in this room would be, given that the biggest external threat to any law school right now is the shrinking market for its product. Technical people 
whether they work with computers or fix cars or teach tax, <laughs> often don't explain things terribly well. Some of this is a lack of social skills, some of it's a lack of communication skills, and some of it is a kind of joie de vivre that comes along with expertise. Most often, it's a radical misunderstanding of what users want to hear by way of explanation, made worse by user impatience at actually having to learn anything. Uh, for a while, I, when I was actually doing frontline computer work, I, I found it much easier to explain all networking problems by blaming them on sunspots on Neptune. <laughs> uh, it, it, it sounded kind of scientific, and the few users who realized that it was not a serious explanation thought it was a kind of funny shorthand for it. I can't possibly explain this to you in the time that you have. Uh, and, and so it was. But too often technologists really do speak a separate language. At the worst, that separate language and institutional blindness combine and harden into a separate culture with its own language. Sometimes this is simply baffling techno-gibberish. Uh, these days, it is just as likely to be management speak full of words like enterprise, partnering, and core competency. <laughs> Both are the language of priests and gatekeepers, not of consultants and collaborators. The LII is not immune to this. Uh, we once hired a fundraiser who was perpetually baffled by emailed phrases like, winter has been taken out of the cluster so that its back end can resync. <laughs> At least she was honest about it, which improved our internal communication enormously. I'm never honest about it, and Dan Nagy actually believes that I understand the email he sent me. <laughs> uh, don't tell him. Uh, we're all familiar with technology for its own sake in the form of the wildly misguided experiment. There, there was, for example, the law school that wanted to use online chat as a teaching tool in one of its classes, and finding it too difficult to support chat clients on all the computers and uh, all of the students' home computers, they installed a chat client on all the computers in one 30-seat lab where they held class via keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> More often, though, technologists practice technology for its own sake because that's what interests them. It wouldn't be technologists if it didn't. But they need to understand that this makes them seem, sometimes seem out of touch and far too easy to bribe. It's amazing how much you can get by getting somebody a bigger monitor. <laughs> I said I'd return to the problem of technologists being managed by non-technologists, and this is a good time because at root it really is a communication problem. Sooner or later, anybody working at any level of any organization is going to be saddled with a supervisor who needs to be educated. Educating supervisors about operational realities is simply a requirement in most organizations, whether the organization knows it or not and whether the staff knows it or not. Technologists need to make every effort to communicate clearly up the hierarchy, and if the organization persistently fails to listen, leave. Does no good to pout, though of course we all do. Many bad acts that screw up organizations are just too petty to catalog in a talk like this. I think of them as tiny little daggers. Slights, snubs, acts of individual arrogance are, are inevitable, particularly in law schools. I think law schools are stupid when they ignore such in injuries because they build up and cause problems. You can think of them as repetitive st stress disorders. Uh, it doesn't take much of this sort of thing to make a workplace dysfunctional, and that is especially true when a few bad actors can act out without consequences. That creates a cynical resentment that is all the more resilient because it gets slathered with platitudes about developing consensus or respecting differences, and my personal favorite, being a team player. None of those are bad ideas, except when they result in the treatment of symptoms rather than disease, or in covering up real problems with corporate cliches. Now, from my point of view, there may be no I in team, but there is a you in suck. <laughs> is this just parking? No. No, no, it's not. Uh, and if I've been scolding, it, it's with a larger purpose in mind. I think that law schools are facing a period of highly disruptive change over which they will have a great deal less control than they think. It's going to last far longer than they think it will, and it may well be permanent. A free market alarmist might say at this point that one in four law schools needs to go away and that the survivors need to cut their tuition in half. That's a radical statement of a radical view, 
But I think few would deny that big changes are coming for many of us, whether as a result of direct economic pressure on our institutions or because legal jobs are going away and large employers are rethinking their business models. So that's scary in itself. But what's really scary is the fact that no resolution of that situation will be stable. Legal education may not be significantly downsized, but it will almost certainly be globalized, commodified, reorganized, and repriced. That is going to happen at what seems like dizzying speed, although in fact the pace of change is going to be far slower than it would be outside academia. American business, and particularly American management science, began to deal with that kind of volatility in the mid-1980s. Two years before this conference began, Peter Drucker wrote in the Harvard Business Review that every enterprise is composed of people with different skills and knowledge doing many different kinds of work. For that reason, it must be built on communication and individual responsibility. Each member has to think through what he or she aims to accomplish and make sure that associates know and understand that aim. Each has to think through what he or she owes to others and make sure that others understand and approve. Each has to think through what is needed by others and make sure others know what is expected of them. And Rosabeth Bucks Cantor remarked that this new kind of business hero must learn to operate without the might of the hierarchy behind them. The crutch of authority must be thrown away and replaced by their own ability to make relationships, to use influence, and to work with others to achieve results. By contrast, I work in a place that once had a food fight over whether or not a pre-tenure visiting faculty member was allowed to use the word colleagues as the salutation in a memo. <laughs> he was trying to organize a faculty student softball game. <laughs> in her 1995 commencement address at a small college in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Judith Martin, AKA Miss Manners, remarked that societal concern with etiquette becomes greatest during times of social upheaval and cultural change. I hope that we will find a new etiquette that supports communication across hierarchy, one that rewards initiative rather than allowing the etiquette that we have now to harden into creative paralysis. As to the crutch of authority, I would add only to that that lack of authority can also be a crutch. You know, what can you do? It'll never change. Why bother? Good question. But if we're willing to bother, willing to bother people by being unmannerly when Larry is mad, then here are some ways to do it. Stop the turf wars. We are fighting turf wars that have their roots in fears about the erosion of professional work, anxieties about status, and very real competition for resources. They need to be replaced by clear functional analysis that asks who is most capable of what, what should be bought, what should be built, and that analysis needs to take place without any regard to existing departmental lines, and it must assess need without respect to risk. <coughs> we need to communicate directly and honestly, especially about capacity. Organizations talk to themselves constantly about what they're able to do. Sometimes that talk is less than honest. We pad budgets knowing they'll be cut, we skew our organizations excessively toward the outward manifestations of customer service, using the help desk as a way to patch systems that would not need repair had they not been planned by people distracted by help desk calls. <laughs> we do too much over under-promising and over-delivering when we should simply be promising and delivering. Analyze failure. We don't talk about failures nearly enough because it's not safe enough to fail, let alone talk about it in polite company. Good organizations fail all the time and the best ones learn from it. Constant, inexpensive experimentation, even with a fair share of failures, is far cheaper for the organization than ponderous committee-laden approval processes, memoranda, strategic plans, and so on. There's a zone between heedless and hidebound, and the price of staying in it is that things go wrong some of the time. So what? We need to recognize innovation, or at least respond to it. We need to pay attention to innovation, and we need to respond to it rationally. The recent history of legal education is littered with innovations whose potential either went unrecognized or unfulfilled. There's a world of useful technique out there, 
and we're still putting up PowerPoints and talking about whether it would be seemly to evaluate students outside the exam period or let them bring a basic professional tool into the classroom. For 20 years now, this conference has existed as a space where there's the potential for honest conversation between law teachers, law librarians, and law school technologists. We share a common curiosity and a common purpose. This conference has things to show and tell that are worth seeing and hearing. Little too often we sing to the choir, just as I've been doing here at times, honest conversations are hard. But the most meaningful conversations, the, one that's over the, the ones that over the long run bring the greatest rewards, are difficult to begin. They start with misunderstandings or with news that the parties find uncomfortable, with things that either or both parties just can't help but say. They're risky. I hope that some of those conversations, or at least the mutual reconnaissance that leads to them, will start here in the next few days. And if Kent is unmannerly, big fucking deal. <laughs> Thank you.